I, my name originally by birth was Raul or Raul, depending on the country that they are pronouncing it. But I am honestly uh, not picky at all about my name since I am aware it is uh, has some difficult pronunciations. So let me just share the screen. And um, of course, it's a pleasure to go after Johan. Uh, I've been in touch with him now for a while. And even we had an interview uh, recently. So he's a wonderful professional. And as I also was, uh, well, paying special attention to his talk. So it's an extraordinary speaker as well. Uh, so let me just give you a brief uh, about what I'm going to discuss today. It's a bit technical. I'm going to try to keep it uh, actually before time, 19. I have 20 minutes, so I try to keep it in 18 minutes. There is a task because it's a fully technical topic. But anyway, if you have any doubts, you would like clarifications, you would like to have the presentation with you, please feel free to ping me on, on LinkedIn and I will, I will surely share it with you. So let me just give you a brief. Today is going to be uh, a topic focused on Python programming language, since, as you know, uh, AI and machine learning, though, are one and the same in general terms. Uh, normally, there is a very conceptual approach to it, but we have to remember that this field without practicality and without any sort of implementation in the business or the industry is as good as nothing. So that's why I'm going to touch upon the practical aspects itself. I'm getting this topic directly from my PhD thesis, which this is, well, of course, a brief of it in a very um, statistical manner without going too much into detail. But anyway, I will give you a glimpse of the technical aspects around it. Let me uh, give you a heads up. My current area of research is very much focused on healthcare, especially on 3D, on 3D organ printing, as well as utilizing quantum computing combined with deep learning and various quantum algorithms in order to improve the performance and the speed of deep learning. And that is one of the things I have done during, during the thesis. Most of the research have been based in the EU, in various companies, as well as in certain Asian, especially South Asian uh, com companies and well, uh, different countries, obviously India among them since I reside here. So the topic, as you can see on your screen, this is structured in two parts. One is the conceptual aspects, the other is the technical aspects. In terms of the conceptuality of it, I will very briefly run through it since time is of, of the essence. Firstly, it will be how AI or machine learning in this case will be implemented in the human resources spectrum. What is the ROI? What are the steps to go about it? What sort of cases or what companies are running uh, this kind of algorithms right now, either uh, through certain outsourcing or in-house development and then a very personal case to me, which exactly that was the case of my PhD, which is the Chinese social credit score system transfer towards the uh, commercial or the corporate aspects. And then on the technical side, basically you will see how the evolution of this uh, implementation comes through facial recognition, voice identification, sentiment analysis, and so on and so forth. There are various parameters. I have reduced as many as I could to constrain it within the time. But uh, if you would like to have a more extensive discussion, please, again, feel free to reach me or ping me. Now, uh, what is the implementation of AI in HR? It is actually very simple. It's, it's not as complicated as it sounds. We have to remember that machine learning or deep learning will not assist without the field of psychology, sociology, anthropology, since it has a very huge load from liberal arts. Considering this and keeping in mind that HR, human resources, really rely on the human factor for obvious reasons. We have to bear in mind one thing. The, the aspects of AI implementing in HR are focused upon, first of all, obviously solving the business challenge, which is a general application of AI. Then you move into attracting and developing talent within and outside the company, either for the current employees or the candidates. Then moving into the employee experience, as well as the, obviously the predicting the, the analytical support and what is the employee performance, what is the candidate engagement, and lastly, as usual, companies rely on budgets, so AI will have to be implemented to see how to make efficient use of this budgeting as well. This is uh, overall the structure. Obviously, each of them has certain technical aspects to it, which can be highly extended, but to give you a glimpse, this is how it is a structure. Now, the ROI companies normally tend to ask me this a lot. What is the ROI? Why should I implement um, algorithms of this sort in my company, be it an SME or a startup. Well, in general terms, AI it creates a personalized learning for the HR, HR functions and for employees. And then obviously once this learning, this process learning has been created, 
there is going to be certain metrics to it, how to measure it, what improvements have take, taken place, and what is the exact output, um, well, how fruitful it is. And obviously, uh, at the end of the day, similarly as the budget, the financial metrics. How has these algorithms improved our company? How, how, how they have actually helped us develop our budgeting and our finances, which is at the end of the day is our business run. So these questions is what constantly pops into founders, into CEOs, CTOs, minds. And that is what I, the kind of questions I get on a usual basis. And this is what we need to keep in mind before implementing any sort of algorithms, especially in the HR functions, but in any department overall. To do it step by step, well, normally companies examine it in various ways. First, they check who, who has done it prior, what areas we can focus upon in terms of our needs as a company. Then we need to decide whether to build or to buy, whether to outsource it or whether to build it in-house. And then obviously, how to make these algorithms self-funding and self-reliable. That means that it ha they have to create profit in some way or the other, be it either in reducing expenses, be it in optimizing the budget, and there are other case scenarios. Uh, so this, as this aspect is what needs to be discussed, needs to be examined, needs to be considered in order to take a call. And you will face this for whoever wants to implement this in SMEs or startups. You will face these parameters and these steps are extremely required to do the, the right implementation because you might have noticed that right now everybody is an AI expert or machine learning uh, expert or deep learning uh, Mm, professional. So you need to be very careful because several, several startups have been proven to be fraudulent with these activities. So we need to be very careful and very analytical and, and we need to really question what kind of algorithms have been used, what kind of functions have been put in place, what sort of implementation are, uh, is taking over the, the regular human driven functions. So all these are very critical questions here. Some business cases which you know about the Google, IBMs of the world are of course using this kind of algorithms for a while now, uh, since 2017. Companies like IBM have even saved over $100 million on these parameters. But anyway, these are uh, aspects which we can discuss offline. I don't want to spend much time on these aspects here. The Chinese social security score system is something I really, really want to stop a little on. Let me just show you. For those who don't know what this is, this is basically a social implementation of punishment and reward, which is part of AI called reinforcement learning. Now, in this case, the system penalizes or rewards citizens in base of how good or bad they behave according to certain standards. The standards can be such as jumping traffic lights, spitting in the streets, uh, stealing money, certain fraudulent activities, and obviously the opposite will be uh, the exact opposite actions and each one of them will be rewarded or punished accordingly. The citizens in certain cities of China will be awarded up to 900 points, normally 1,000, but the maximum right now is 900. The average will be 700, and below 400 will be considered a bad citizen, and this will be penalized in terms of not allowed to access the schools, not allowed to travel, not allowed to access healthcare in certain ways, and so on and so forth, the list goes on. Uh, so you need to keep this in mind. Why did I select this? I selected this because I found the algorithms being used on a deep learning spectrum very interesting and very approachable to the corporate side. And I wonder, some years ago, how exactly could, be, could, could this be run in the HR department in a company? And how could companies benefit from this? What are the pros, what are the cons, what are the privacy issues, and what are, of course, the psychological uh, harassments or, or negativity aspects for, from the employee perspective? To give you a glimpse, this is how more or less is the structure. And well, you can figure out what I exactly try to transfer things off. Bear in mind that my research was very much focused on quantum, utilizing both quantum algorithms as well as deep, deep learning algorithms. So there, there was a huge uh, computer science as well as mathematical load on it. And it took some years of, of exploration, but anyway, the results were pretty optimistic. Now the codes I'm going to show you right now are basic, nothing complex. They are perfectly run on Jupyter Notebook on Python. And well, you will see that most of them you might have probably come across. The first one is facial recognition. I'm not going to run through the code in detail because we are lacking time, but let's may I remind one thing. Uh, when you run a facial recognition aspect or parameter or algorithm on Python, as you know, Python is very uh, user friendly. So running and loading different facial emotions uh, like anger, disgust, happiness, sadness, so on, will give you an output looking like this, what you can see in your screen. Now you might wonder, why is this useful in any way? 
I will answer. I will answer questions at the end. Uh, otherwise, I, I will keep. I will lose track of, of, of the time as well. Uh, why is this useful during HR functions or within the HR department? Well, this is useful for one interviews to question whether employees are being legit and about the answers or not. Secondly, to understand employee satisfaction as well as uh, employees' uh, performance when there's, uh, of course, an HR questioning and, and cross-checking. And more importantly, facial recognition is cross-check along with voice recognition and along with sentiment analysis. So for example, if the algorithm tells me that this particular person might or might not be uh, truthful enough or legit enough about the statements, I might not rely completely on the facial recognition algorithm because it might be inaccurate or people might be able to fake it. So hence, keeping this in mind, I will correlate it with the output of the voice recognition, which is here. Now, voice recognition is a bit more complex than computer vision in relies on NLP. And here we are measuring various other aspects, such as pitch, intensity, decibels, and so on. So considering all this, we will measure whether exactly, let me just jump to the last aspect here. Okay. We will measure whether the, the, the sentence is being spoken. And of course, the algorithm will track down this and we will correlate the results of the voice with the results of the facial emotions and correlate where the common points are or where the loopholes are. Accordingly, we can even draw conclusions on whether the employee might be or might not be lying. Uh, this is to give you, of course, a very simple, simple glimpse. This is driven by AI-induced cameras, normally CCTV or uh, automatic tripod cameras. I have tested this and what happens is when the system creates their own questions as well, by the way. So what happens is if I ask the employee, are you willing to relocate? Let's assume that my job profile is in another city and the employee says yes. And then the next immediate question will be, is your family willing to relocate? So the system will analyze what the answers, what the questions, what the exact uh, wish output is, which will be yes. And if the output is not matching, it will understand why. I will, of course, analyze the, the parameters involving it and accordingly give me a solution or an output on the same. And I will take my calls as a human. I will take a final call. So in this way, we are trying to reduce bias for one, and we are trying to increase a bit of accuracy in the hiring process. If we rely completely on the camera, obviously there are going to be certain inaccuracies that might take place at some point. Just to get a bit on a technical side, here we are using uh, CNN, Convolutional Neural Networks, uh, on 70% accuracy, which is not bad, but it's also not significant enough. And of course, we are using uh, for the understanding of male, female, as well as the emotion which is being spoken. And then, as I said, we correlate this with the faces. Similarly, we can run this on <coughs> CV screening. Now, when you do CV screening, the output will look something like this. Now, when you run your CV, as you know, uh, the ATS system is there, but this is not ATS, it's a bit a top notch ahead. So what it does is, not, it does not only analyze keywords, it also analyze employment gaps, it can analyze the types of employment, what is the current job position being applied to, what are the requirements for that job position, and so on. Accordingly, it will give me outputs like this, where what particular field that individual might belong to better. In that case, if there are openings in the company, obviously they will be recommended by the system as well. So there's a recommendation system attached to it beyond the CV screening. And hence, we can increase that uh, employee or candidate engagement. For example, if you apply for a position which might not really match your profile, but I have another opening which really matches your profile, the system will recommend that profile automatically from the database. But right now, it's not happening in, in regular, regular link companies. And this can be obviously a huge improvement and we can avoid uh, unemployment in a large way. When it comes to uh, employee or candidate engagement, here we relied on deep learning induced uh, chatbots with carers. Now, why do we rely there? Let me just jump through the end so we don't waste time in this. Uh, here we are. Okay, here. Now, what does the chatbot do? The chatbot uh, does two things. First, you enter center questions, normally beyond 1,000 questions, and the chatbot learns the answers for those questions and reproduces them accordingly. Secondly, it tends to learn from new questions, just like uh, Google, Google Home or Amazon Echo may do at the moment. We have implemented this in, in the university right now in, in Watson, just to test it. And, and we analyze it in base of students' questions. So what questions do students normally ask to the faculty members in terms of whatever it might be, what is the course outline, what is going to be covered, and so on and so forth. And accordingly, we draw conclusions and we draw answers from that 
and we enter into the system. So the system will answer those questions to the student. So the faculty does not need to be available all the time. So we have tested this. It has worked quite well, I, I can say. The accuracy has been 80 percent, and some students uh, have not really identified who is the human, who is the, what is the algorithm, who is speaking when. So that means it's going well at the moment, and this has also been tested in certain HR departments uh, back in Europe for the same purpose. Obviously, there are certain GDPR issues, privacy concerns. As you know, the, the GDPR in Europe is pretty strict in this regard, so we have to be very careful. But other than that, uh, it works pretty smoothly. Now, jumping to employee attrition, what do we do here? We analyze these factors you can see on the screen. I'm going to stop to read all of them, otherwise uh, we'll really run out of time. But as you can see, there are various key factors, some selling eight. You can increase them if you wish. Your data set uh, will be loaded, of course, on the code, and you will run it. There are various parameters, such as distance, where, where the employee is living, how, how much, how far from the office, how many hours does the employee live, what is the satisfaction, what is the salary, how many times have been promoted or not in the last years. So various parameters are being in place. And what is happening, this is a very generic code, but uh, one implementation which is pretty useful is to utilize three different algorithms for, to test it. One is uh, logistic regression, one is random forest, and the last one is uh, support vector machine, SBM. In this case, random forest gives the higher accuracy, as you can see in the screen on the top button, 0.98, which is pretty significant and the output will be this. As you can see in the output, where is the arrow pointing, there are, there's a percentage basis on how likely the employee or the employees of certain departments. This is normally run uh, individually, not department-wise, but anyway, you can do it also department-wise. And you will measure the percentage or how likely the employees to leave due to what reason. So this is pretty helpful in that way, so you know where to, where to look at and what to tackle before it takes over and before the bomb actually explodes in the company. Um, this I have tested in real life. I can tell you that accuracy is significant on, in the lab setting. However, in the actual world setting, in the workplace, it might be a bit tricky in terms of not always the, the distance being from the office, not being promoted, low, low salaries, correlates to attrition, as you know, humans are unpredictable. So hence, this psychological factor, this cognitive factor, is quite missing in the, in the algorithms. And I am yet to figure out how to implement it. Of course, this is a very huge area of research yet, but it's ongoing on my, on my end. So I hope to have an answer, a fruitful answer, uh, soon enough to provide it with. And um, I have made it on time, surprisingly. So I am going to just answer the questions, which is what I'm actually hoping for, rather than just, just making it theoretical and monologue. So I can see. Um, OK. There is a question here if I might just read it and answer it myself. Has there been substantial progress in trying to adopt analogies from human psychology reward behavior or reinforcement learning algorithms? Uh, yes, so indeed, because, well, reinforcement algorithms do exist because reinforcement exists in the initial psychological experiments, and hence we have derived that from psychology and consequently implemented in the NDI spectrum. Uh, yes, there's been progress. I, can, I mean, I can speak from my own research, not, not speak for others, but on my end, yes, there has been certain improvement, especially using quantum algorithms, I may have mentioned, because uh, this improves a lot the accuracy as well as the speed. Uh, when talking about being able to track down employees in, in a simple, in, a, in an office space where there are a thousand employees at once, and the algorithms are able to track down every single parameter of employees, what are they saying, when they are saying, how they're expressing it. Uh, obviously, there are certain consent uh, and privacy issues to be signed beforehand before you can implement these algorithms. And in certain countries, like in certain continents like the EU, and the countries involved in the same, uh, this is unthinkable because of GDPR. But countries like Singapore, China, India, you might easily test this. Uh, without any major privacy concerns on this regard. So yes, the reinforcement learning is working. In fact, China is using it on social basis. And I have tested it myself on the human, on the human, uh, each other, human resources factor. I see another question. If you want to use chat, chatbots for tests in COVID, how can you use your algorithms? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So do you want to utilize this particular Mm, chaos induced chatbot for 
mm, testing what exactly within COVID. I'm not pretty sure what you're trying to, to convey here. If you can just reframe the question, I'll be happy to answer it. And if there are any more questions, of course, let me know. If a person is infected, oh, well, yes, I mean, there are, there are applications for that. You can obviously develop a chatbot, but this is as useful as this. Uh, this is an Indian application for this, which is not a chatbot, but it's sort of not deep learning. I don't recall the name right now, but uh, there is no rel reliability in this. Is my, if I say, yes, I am infected or no, I'm not infected, or yes, I have the symptoms, there is no reliability on that if you implement uh, uh, deep learning enabled facial recognition and voice as well as utilizing it for for x-rays analysis which is derived from breast cancer prediction then yes of course but a chatbot merely a chatbot uh, no there is no magic here and that won't be a, that won't be able to give you any sort of reliability or accuracy in the long run that I can assure you there is no there is no uh, any sort of um, accuracy concern on that so I think from my end, I have completed 20 minutes, including questions. If you have any, one more question, I, as far as the hosts allow me to answer it, I'd be happy to do so.